Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the October 2023 edition of the St. Louis Java Users Group. For those who don't know, the St. Louis Java Users Group is an informal group. Attendance is free. We don't maintain a formal membership list. Now, our normal meeting date is the second Thursday of every month, except December when there is no meeting. But yes, I know this is Wednesday, and we made a change this month in order to accommodate our speaker's schedule. And normally we don't meet in December, it's because there's just too many things going on over the holidays for us to be able to organize a meeting in December. When we meet in person, you can join us for food and social at 6 p.m. and the meeting starts at 6.30 p.m. And when we were meeting in person prior to the pandemic, we were meeting in the Object Computing Incorporated training room, and that's at 12,140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310, and that is in St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to introduce the other members of the St. Louis Java Users Group Steering Committee. So from left to right, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Zimmerman, Bruce Allspaugh, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Swang. I'm Bruce, the person standing right there in the middle. You can e email all of us on the steering committee by sending an email address to that email address that's at the bottom of your screen. That's javasig sc at ociweb.com and we will all get that so i'd like to thank uh the latest member of our steering committee robert levitt and he is with us here tonight the st louis java users group would not be possible without the support of our jug sponsors so from left to right top to bottom we have object computing incorporated they are our original sponsor going back to 1997 when the jug was founded. So thank you very much for being with us all those years. JFrog is also another important sponsor because they sponsor the subscription fee for the Zoom account, which makes these remote meetings possible. So thank you to JFrog for covering that. Signature Consultants and Adaptive Solutions Group are headhunters. So if you are looking to you know, fill a Java job, like you're looking to get hired, or if you're a company and you need to hire Java developers, just do a quick Google search for signature uh, consultants or adaptive solutions group and let them know that you found out about them through the St. Louis Java Users Group. At the end of the meeting, we will be raffling two JetBrains licenses for basically any product of your choice, really any of the desktop products. Now, you must be present to win. This will be at the end of the meeting. So I'm sorry if you're watching the recording. You're too late. You do have to be present to enter the raffle at the end for the JetBrains licenses. Elastic is, is uh, they're the company behind Elasticsearch. They have sponsored gift cards for us in the past. Intertech is a training company. So if you're looking to expand your programming skills, they have lots of online video training and other training resources available on the Intertech website. So Intertech has sponsored the famous Screaming Flying Monkeys. What? Screaming Flying Monkeys? Oh, they're little dolls. And if you throw them up against the wall, they scream. They're a lot of fun. And also some coffee cups and mouse pads, too. So we appreciate that. Now, at the end of the presentation here tonight, we will be raffling two Manning eBooks of your choice. And just like the JetBrains licenses, you do have to be present to win if you're just watching the recording. Sorry, it's too late. So you do want to stay to the end for that. Pearson has also sponsored physical computer books for us as well over the years. So thank you to all of our JUG sponsors. As far as announcements go, I got an email saying that the JCon World 2023 conference is coming up. That is an online conference that will take place November 20 
through the 22nd. And the really cool thing to note about it is you can get a free three-day jug ticket to that online conference. And all you have to do is just go to that website there that's on your screen, 2023.world.jcon.1. And when you go to register, there is uh, an, an option where you can uh, get a free three-day jug ticket to attend that conference. So I thought I would pass that along so that people can take advantage of that. All right, so as far as upcoming presentations go, it's easy. Just watch our meetup page. That's meetup.com slash gateway jug, and you will get all the latest updates to the presentation schedule and location. So as soon as we have next month's presentation schedule, it will be posted there on Meetup at that site. And as soon as you see that posting, you can go ahead and RSVP so that you'll get a reminder. Now, if you're interested in giving a presentation, and we welcome people who like to give presentations, or if you would like to become a sponsor of the JUG, just drop us an email to that steering committee address that I gave you before. That's javasigsc at ociweb.com. So, all right, enough about me. Now we're ready for tonight's presentation, and that will be on revisiting design patterns after Java 21. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click a button here to stop sharing my screen, and that will allow our speaker tonight to share his screen and take it away. All right, I hope you can see my screen. And thank you, Bruce, and the organizers of the St. Louis Jug. I've never been to St. Louis. I hope I'll be able to meet you in person someday. Well, yeah. welcome aboard. I can hear you and see your slides just well. Thank you. Uh, as I said, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here uh, talking to you. And I'm going to be speaking about one of my favorite subjects, which is design patterns. I know that I mentioned uh, 21. I forgot to update the number because this is a, a evergreen presentation. I'm always trying to update with the latest features of Java. Uh, nothing changed between 2021, so don't worry. Uh, it's up to a date. I reviewed all my uh, samples uh, two weeks ago, so we're still up to date. Um, at Sonyanaga, you can see my email on the screen, just in case you have any questions. If you want to reach out to me, you can always email eyanaga at google.com. Or if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Yanaga. And I try to be consistent across most social media. So if you just type Yanaga, it's very likely that I'll be the one you, you'll find. If not, it's probably related. So maybe they'll be able to, to point it uh, to me as well. So when we're talking about design patterns, of course, the idea comes from this book, the original Gang of Four book, which was released in, in 1994. So it has been quite some time. And the samples also were written in C++. And a lot of things changed. Uh, first of all, we're in a JUG meeting. So of course, we're Java users and Java developers. And you know that it took some time for us to be able to find some books about design patterns uh, in which the examples were written, written in Java. So, and not only Java, but we the samples that we had in the past were written in older versions of Java. Technology evolved, the problems evolved, the context changed, and now we have different ways of solving the same problems or new problems that can be solved in new ways. So that's why I, I thought it was important for us to revisit this particular subject. That's why we're talking about design patterns tonight. And some of the ideas that I got from this book, of course, after I started my research, I found a lot of content, some very good repos on the internet. For example, I found a talk from Mario Fusco about five or six years ago. Yeah, we had similar ideas in some design patterns. So it's nice to see that 
uh, the community can converge to some to, to some reusable uh, solutions for the exact same context uh, from different people. Some other design patterns, some of them I took from this book, Domain Driven Design, which is also a classic. I think Domain Driven Design from 95, 97. So it has been quite some time that the book was written as well. And of course, uh, Effective Java, also a favorite subject uh, uh, for myself. I also have a, another talk revisiting Effective Java. I have multiple different recordings on YouTube, just in case you want to check. And I got some of the ideas from Effective Java into this talk. So these are some of the, the sources of the, of the content that I'll be presenting today to you. Java 2021, very fresh, was released last month. Uh, we're oh, three weeks away. So September 19th, uh, 2023. So uh, if you're still using Java 8, 7, Java 11, Java 17, a lot of things change in the Java language, and we'll be using some of the latest and greatest features of Java. I think the big game changer was Java 8 with the Lambda expressions. Uh, I think it changed uh, a lot of the old legacy design patterns that we had. But of course, some of the recent features of, uh, of the latest versions of Java, they changed some of the design patterns that I'm going to show you today. So if you're still stuck in an older Java version, if you can upgrade, I strongly recommend you to do so, not only for the security updates, but also because of the developer productivity features that we have available. And you can see here a question also. Oh, if you have any questions, we can fire here in the chat. I'll try to read them and try to answer uh, as soon as I can uh, uh, read that. And Nehal is asking, what about new problems because of virtual threads or collections in newer Java versions? I can see some, some benefits and problems, of course, in everything that we introduce. I don't think I'll be covering any virtual threads because virtual threads is an implementation detail. Uh, mostly, uh, I think mostly the frameworks will catch up. Spring, Quarkus, and other implementations will be able to catch up. I suppose that unless you're doing implementing your own thread pool uh, underneath your code, you won't be affected at all by virtual threads. So leave that to the framework designers. You just need to be aware of um, if you have any limitations that can block any of the virtual threads. And for collections, I don't think we are impacted and in any of the design patterns that I'm presenting today. But if you find an issue, I'm going to share the GitHub repo. I'm accepting bugs, uh, pull requests, feature requests, uh, all on GitHub issues. Oh, you mean streams? Uh, yes, we'll be covering streams today. Uh, streams, uh, Lambda exceptions. Uh, yes, uh, we, we're going to use some of the features. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. So some context here, a uh, design pattern is a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem within a given context. So for us to be able to name something a design pattern, we have to, to focus on the, the blue words here. General reusable solution for a problem within a given context. If you try to apply design pattern in the wrong context, you're not trying to create a solution. Very likely, you're trying to create more problems than you had before. And one of the fun stories that when I first heard about design patterns, when I learned about design patterns back in 2000, I had a, I had a class about uh, design patterns. And I found, oh, that's a wonderful idea. Then I went back to my code base and I was trying to find problems to be able to use the design patterns. And I still remember the first time I uh, I read about, for example, the visitor design pattern, which is very complex and very hard to read, but I wanted to find. So I created a problem so I could find the solution. And I was very proud of myself at the time. Now I just know it was something stupid just to, uh, it just created more problems than what we had before. So it's important for us to remember general reusable solution for a problem within a context. 
change the context. Uh, design planners, they have trade-offs. I strongly encourage you to, to know and learn more about the trade-offs. If you don't have the right context, uh, you won't be able to, to assess the same trade-offs. You probably have a worse solution than you had before. But I also think that uh, the greatest benefit of design patterns in the past 25 years, 25 plus years, was that design patterns allowed us to create a pattern language. So now when we're talking to other developers, older or younger, or when we're a team, we're uh, into a new team and we want to explain a problem or a solution. For example, we, you find a code base. Oh, and I have this particular piece of code, this problem that we want to solve. We want to be able to have like, pluggable implementations, and we want to be able to change the implementation that we're going to use depending on the type uh, of the class that is going to be used. And we want to be able to change the, the type at runtime. It needs to it needs to be configurable and it needs to be expandable, ext extensible. So, well, I just spent like one or two minutes trying to explain the problem and the solution. Uh, 30 years ago, maybe I needed to do that. But today, if a person know design patterns, they would know that automatically what I just explained. Oh, you mean you want to apply a strategy design pattern? So we created a pattern language and we can share this knowledge. Oh, you should be using a strategy here. Yeah, maybe a strategy is not a perfect match. Maybe we could be using like a visitor or maybe we could use an enhanced switch from... Java 20 plus. Uh, so we can discuss, uh, the discussion goes a, a level higher because we already have a common ground of knowledge. We already know design patterns and we can share this common knowledge through a pattern language. I think that's one of the greatest benefits of what we're doing with design patterns. And some of the guiding principles that I had when trying to create or propose some new implementations for these design patterns were, of course, I uh, uh, got these from some great authors from other great books. One of them from the original Game Book 4 book, favor composition over inheritance. So you see that especially after Java 8, we're favoring much more uh, lambdas and functional interfaces than inheritance. And we're trying to compose those solutions in strength instead of trying to create a hierarchy of classes in whatever we do. So we're using much more interfaces and functional composition rather than trying to create hierarchies in our in our code base. The second principle favors smaller interfaces. Instead of trying to create interfaces with multiple methods, now we're trying to create interfaces with at most one abstract method. If you want to create interfaces with default methods, it's okay. But most of the fun, most of the time you should be favoring smaller interfaces, one single method. And why is that? Because if you have single methods, you can use that particular interface as lambdas. And uh, another principle that we need to emphasize here is to not only have smaller interfaces, but uh, favor existing interfaces in the JDK. You see in Java 8, we introduced about 39 functional interfaces in the JDK. And now we have even more. And this functional interface that we have in the JDK, very likely they're covering 99% of the use cases that we have in our code base. For example, if we have uh, if we need an interface that receives one parameter and uh, of type of one particular type and returns the same type, you have an operator. If you have like if you're returning a different type, you have uh, 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 function. And if you're, you're receiving a type and you're returning void, you have a consumer. If you receive void, you, you have no arguments and return a new type, you have a producer. So these are the interfaces that are already available on the JDK. Most developers by now should be aware of most of those interfaces. So they already have a pre-existing knowledge. You already have a, a language to share uh, with other developers, so you don't need to create a new interface. Because every time you create a new interface, you're creating a new noun. And whenever somebody digs into your existing code base, they need to learn what does that noun mean? 
Oh, whenever you have this noun, this particular interface, it means that I'll have this method signature. So you have more, more area to be able to cover when you're learning a new code base. A counter argument to that, of course, trade-offs, is that uh, when I was presenting this session at DevOps France earlier this year, one of the um, uh, developers over there, they, they told me that sometimes I want to create a new interface. Yeah, I, even I want to extend an existing JDK interface, for example, a function. I want to extend that just to give a new name. Because when I'm writing, I want to be able to click on that interface in my IDE. And I want to be able to search for that. And then I'll find all the occurrences of that particular interface in my code base. I think it's a perfectly valid point. So as everything that we're doing, there are trade-offs. I want you to have the knowledge to be wise enough to know when to use one of these proposed solutions that I'm going to present to you and when not to use it. So we're here to share knowledge. I'm not saying that uh, everything I'm saying is truth. I'm saying that it's uh, something that we maybe we should know so we can tell when it's a good solution and when it's a bad one. Remember, context, a design pattern is a general, general reusable solution for a problem in a given context. So it's it's always nice for us to, to know the context is which we're applying our, our knowledge. So some of the patterns that I'm going to cover today, I don't know if I'll be able to cover everything because of time. And I know that uh, the source code is available. You'll be able to, to appreciate the, the, the lines of code much better on your own time later uh, on GitHub. You can clone the repo. You can check if I made any mistakes. And actually last week I fixed a bug, a bug in the code base. I uh, had like two lines. Uh, there was a bug on that. Somebody filed an issue on GitHub. I quickly fixed that. Thank you so much. That's how we evolve the existing knowledge that we have here. So some of the proposed solutions that I have today are for the command design pattern, observer, strategy, template methods, singleton, interpreter, chain of responsibility, visitor, and specification. We might have more. If you know uh, where are where are any new implementations, please, if you could uh, forward that to me, I'll be more than glad to update both my presentation and my GitHub repo, okay? And before we start with the actual code, I'll try to do some live coding to explain some concepts. If you have a minute, you can go and type this URL in your browser, or you can take a picture, or you can point your mobile phone to this QR code. It's going to point your, uh, directly to the GitHub repo, github.com slash Yanaga slash revisiting design patterns. And I have it open in a tab here, my second screen. So I can even check if I'm typing something wrong when I'm trying to revisit some of the old legacy design patterns, okay? So I think you had enough time to be able to look at the repo and we can come back later. Uh, of course, maybe I can even type here the message github.com slash yanaga slash revisiting design patterns. Okay. So here is the link in the chat as well. So command. Uh, what is uh, the command design pattern? The command design pattern is used when we want to assign what? Assign a type, assign a noun to a particular function in the system. So instead of just writing the method, an existing class, we want to create a type to give it a noun for an existing operation in the system. And the original design pattern has this particular implementation. So you'll create a, an interface called command with one single method, void execute, which for me in particular is a kind of useless uh, um, signature because it receives no arguments and returns nothing which means that all of the information that the command must process must be already internalized in the class that implements this particular interface. Can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. I don't know, I think most of the times you want your method to either receive an argument, at least one argument and return something other than void. But I'm not here to discuss that, just to say that, well, command is when you want to, what? to get an operation and give a type to it, give a noun 
to that particular operation. So you can possibly reuse that in other contexts, or you want to encapsulate everything and make it run in a separate context, maybe in a separate thread. So, uh, but instead of implementing, created in this interface in your code base, you could just, for example, reuse an existing interface. And guess what? Runnable, which has the exact same signature, is already used in uh, things like threads, or you have like an executor from the JDK, you can use the already existing interface runnable. And guess what? It's also already a functional interface. So I recommend you, instead of implementing commands, you can reuse the existing runnable interface from the JDK. What else? Observer. Observer, it was much more common for us to be using Observer in the old days when we had like GUIs written in Swing uh, or something like that. Uh, if you want to implement uh, Observer on the server side these days, very likely we will be creating a queue, very likely a Kafka queue, we will be publishing events and we will be consuming those events. So the observers would be consumers of the Kafka queue. So Observer, uh, it's very limited these days on the use case where you can use uh, in the plain Java implementation, but I think it's worth revisiting anyway. So Observer. Observer have two pieces of the Observer part. And you have the observable and you have the Observer interface. The observable uh, implementation, you have a class on the JDK that is deprecated that implements the observable part. You should never use it because first, because it's deprecated. Second, because the implementation is not thread safe and the interaction order is not guaranteed. So if you want to have the observable part, I recommend you to implement it yourself. So you can choose an underneath collection that suits your requirements. So if you need a guaranteed interaction order, if you need it to be thread safe, you choose the corresponding collection for your particular use case. So it's up to you how you implement the observable part. Regarding the observer part, which is the entity that is going to be notified about changes in your object, you could be creating this interface observer uh, already with generics. You have an observer of type T. And when you receive this notify of type T event, then you're going to react to this particular event on this method that you're going to implement in your class. Instead of creating this interface, well, in the JDK, you have another interface with the exact same signature, which is a consumer interface. Consumer of type T, you just accept a type T, which is very likely in an event that your observable uh, class object is going to send to the other observers, okay? These are the two simplest ones, uh, very likely. And now we're going to dig into the more interesting ones that we have today. So strategy, by far the most common design pattern used everywhere. So how do we implement the strategy one? Let's move to my ID. So the old way for us to be implementing the, the strategy design pattern is to, well, I create here an interface. For example, if you're using, if you decide to use Google Wallet, you learn that there are multiple different ways that you can add passes to your Google Wallet. And here, the definition of strategy is that I want to create a type that represents a different ways for me to implement the same operation. So here I can create a Google Wallet Pass by creating a complete jot with all the information contained in a single jot, or I can pre-create the information and just use the IDs in the jot. Where it's very good when, for example, you already know that the user is going to use the pass anyway and you just to have a small footprint on your the mobile device of the user. So, but if you want to create on the fly, maybe the complete jot is a better alternative for you. So there's no winner here. It really depends on the context, but you want both implementations in your system. So what do you do? You create an interface with the methods, method signature that you need, and you create two different implementations. With here is just a dumb implementation. I just return different strings. And my concrete classes, they both implement the, the same interface. And if I want to use this implementation at runtime, I just create a class here, the Google Wallet endpoint, and I set the strategy 
that I want to use in this particular case, new procreated jot, and it's done. If I want to change that, I could just new complete and voila, I have a different implementation at runtime. So typical strategy implementation. Guess what? In 2023, using Java 21 plus, we don't need to do that anymore. Uh, so the implementation that we can use here is uh, we can do this. Instead of creating multiple different concrete classes from the same interface, what we can do is that in the class that is going to consume the strategy, I can just say, well, set function, because what I did, my strategy, the method signature of my strategy before is just a function which receives a pass information and returns a string. So I'm reusing the existing JDK interface for the strategy. So set function, I could remain this method set strategy just to be consistent. And uh, instead of implementing that, I have a field here in my class, which is a function and the corresponding setter. And whenever I'm instantiating the endpoint, I just say here, endpoint, set function, and what else? I, pre I receive a pass function, pass information. And what do I need to return? I need to return a string. I can a new jot with pre-created information. If it's a single one-liner, I can do it this way. But of course, if your implementation more, is more complex, what would you do? You would be implementing that, that in methods in another class. And what you could do, I created here a class. I created a static method. If my implementation doesn't require any other context from other instances, I can just create a static method and provide the implementation here. If my implementation requires information from other instances, then I create an instance method and I have another implementation here. So I can do this. I can provide the information on the fly. If it's a single one-liner static information, I can also use a method reference, say add to Google Wallet link, and then that may, it's complete because that's a static method. Or I could even use this set function. I can create a new add to Google Wallet instance and use the pre-created method from the instance. So if you're using Java 21 plus, well, you could use this since Java 8. You can use a method reference here this instance very likely would come from a, from a dependency injection framework or something like that, or you could use like a factory to instantiate it, but you're just using an, uh, an instance uh, method reference here. So that's how you would be using, implementing the modern version of the strategy design pattern using new resor newer resources from Java and uh, everything that I'm shown to the, uh, right now is available since Java 8, okay? So this is a strategy. This is the simplest possible design pattern that we could cover today. Let's move forward. So the next one, template methods. What does a template method do? So let's go here to the legacy implementation of template method. The template methods are uh, typical use case. You have multiple different implementations of the same thing, but there are some steps in your code that are always the same, either in the beginning, either in the end, or both. For example, for me to be able to issue a Google Wallet Pass, I always need to authenticate. So this method here needs to be called always. And I need to create a pass which varies depending on what type of pass I want to create. I want to create, do I want to create an event ticket or a loyalty card or a boarding pass? The type of the pass changes, but uh, uh, the other part, the authentication and the sign signing of the jot that is created, it's always the same. So I have something that is always the same here. Always the same here, but the middle part, it varies between implementation. Well, that's when we would use a template method. So typical legacy implementation would be, I would create, uh, I have a method called create pass. I create an abstract method called do create pass in an abstract class. Okay. 
And then in the concrete implementations that are going to extend this abstract class, I implement the part that is different between implementations. So if I have a loyalty Google Wallet pass, I, well, I return a loyalty with the loyalty information. If I have an event ticket, I'm going to return the event ticket information. If I have a boarding pass, I'm going to return what differs. So, and this method implementation, of course, can be very long. I'm just using a very small implementation for uh, uh, demo purposes. Okay. So this is the legacy implementation of the template methods. And when I'm using this code, what do I do? Well, new Google uh, here, I get, get Google Wallet Pass Creator. I'm returning the abstract class. And then I can change the implementation here, even ticket. But I could say, well, return a loyalty Google Wallet Pass Creator. Okay. And I invoke the method create pass and I pass the information. This is a legacy implementation, okay? And as i shown here in the slides, in 2023 with Java 21 plus, uh, the best way for you to use a template, template to implement a template method is to not implement at all. Template method is deprecated. We don't use template methods anymore in 2023. What would we do instead? We replace template method with strategy. So how can we do the same thing, but we've, instead of using template methods, using a strategy? Well, same code here. I have a method called create pass that has an authentication and a signature uh, man, uh, signing method here. In the end, what is the part that is different between implementations? Well, instead of using an abstract method, I receive what? I create a strategy. So again, I create here a field uh, of type function, which receives a pass information and returns a map of string string as a strategy, which is uh, provided in the constructor. It could be a setter as well. I just like constructors. And whenever I need to invoke it, I just do a strategy.apply and I pass the pass information. So where is the implementation? of the, the part that varies. Well, again, as we did in the previous example of the strategy one, this information is passed at runtime. So if I want to implement the get Google Wallet Pass Creator, I can just do this, new Google Wallet Pass Creator. And well, it's going to pass information and I'm going to return a new map of, well, it could be generic and P2, okay. And the same way I did before, I could be using, again, a method reference, a static method reference. I could be using an instance reference method. I could do the same tricks that I did before with the strategy design pattern. All right. So this is for the template methods. Let's move forward. Next design pattern is the singleton. So singleton, the legacy one, what do we use to do? Very likely you might have implemented a singleton in the past. So you would very likely create a private stack final instance um, property, and you would e either already instantiate it, or you would try to do some lazy loading, which is dangerous because then it's not thread safe. And when you do get instance, you return the instance. Well, if you did this in the past, you implemented it wrong because this implementation is not only not thread safe, it's not serialization safe. So if you tried, to, if you had a web app with multiple sessions uh, and your sessions could be, you had a cluster or your sessions could be passivated and activated, you thought you had a singleton, but very likely you had multiple instances of that particular class in your uh, JVM memory, because this implementation doesn't guarantee that there is only a single instance. Uh, if you read Effective Java, uh, it's a very big implementation for you to guarantee a singleton. But luckily for us, the same, the latest version of uh, the Effective Java book show us how can we create a singleton using Java 5 plus features in, a, in the best possible way. So what do we do in uh, if you're using Java 5 plus? Well, instead of using a class, 
and creating a field called uh, instance, well, you create an enum and you just create an instance. Why is that? Because Java, uh, in Java, an enum is a full featured class. You can add fields, you can add methods, you can do everything you do with a class. So enums are a very powerful feature of the Java language. With the added benefit that uh, enums are thread safe and enums, they have the, the uh, they guarantee there's, there's only going to be one single instance in the JVM memory for each one of the enums that you declare. So if you declare only one, just as I did, you know that no matter what happens in the JVM, if the session is serialized, if it's moved, if it's activated, passivated, you will always only have one single instance in the memory, guaranteed. So this is the best possible single implementation that you can have in the JVM. And if you want to create the method here, well, of course, public void run, and you can have a string s, oops, string s, and you can have your, impl your implementation. You can have a static method as well. Oh, and it can return something, produce. Okay. So a singleton, an enum, as an enum is a full feature class. You can do everything that you might need with it. This is the best possible way to implement a singleton. What's next for us? Interpreter. Interpreter, I'll be honest with you. I'll leave it as homework because in my 25 plus years programming Java, I'll have to be honest with you, I never used the interpreter design pattern in production. I coded it in my GitHub repo just because it was, I thought it was a great exercise. I have a, I have a new way of implementing the interpreter design pattern with the latest features of Java. But as I said, I never use this in production. I hope you don't have to, but just in case you do, it's available on the GitHub, well, GitHub repo. And why is that? Because I'm aware of the time that we have tonight and I want to spend more time in more interesting design patterns. So let's move forward with this one. But again, it's on GitHub. You can always check the implementation over there. And it's a very fun one uh, if you want to try. Uh, but I'll leave that as an exercise. Because I want to use two more uh, useful ones, such as the chain of responsibility design pattern. What does the chain of responsibility do? Well, chain of responsibility, uh, a typical use case. Uh, you have a notification in the system and you want to notify your users in multiple different ways, but it's configurable. Like the user can opt to be notified by SMS, by email, by a Google Wallet pass notification, by a phone call, whatever. So you have multiple different options. And it's configurable. The user can choose which of the options they want to receive. And it can be ordered. So you can set a priority to the order in which uh, the notifications uh, are applied. And what's uh, most important, if the user already receives an, received a notification, you don't want to spam the user. So if the user configured that my first option is email, you don't want to send an email, an SMS, a Google Wallet Pass updates, and a phone call. You just want the, to use the first one that succeeds. This is the perfect problem for a chain of responsibility solution. So how did we implement the chain of responsibility in the past? Let's move here, the chain. So the legacy chain of responsibility would do this. So I have a user notifier interface. You will need to create a notify method. You give the context, in this case, the user profile with the preferences uh, for notification. And you always need the next, <coughs> the next piece of the chain. So you need a set next notifier and you would implement an abstract class with a next notifier here. And for each one of the chains, uh, chain links, you will need to implement 
uh, this particular logic. Well, for the Google Wallet Pass update notifier, if the profile has the Google Wallet has a Google Wallet Pass, well, you do whatever you need to do to uh, to send a notification. Else, if the next notifier is not new, you call the next link in the chain. Else, you throw a new runtime exception, for example, or you could ignore. It really depends on how you're going to implement that. For the next link in the chain, email notifier. Well, if the profile allows email, you do whatever you need to do to send the email or else, well, the user doesn't want an email. <clears throat> then you check. Do you have another notifier in the chain? Do you have another link in the chain? If you do, you invoke the next one. So you're basically cascading method invocations uh, inside your chain for each one of the links in the chain. Okay, SMS, whatever. Then you would have to go here into your code. You would create the Google Wallet Pass Update Notifier, the email notifier, the SMS notifier, and you would have to assemble the chain by saying, this is the first link. Well, the next link is the email notifier. Then the email notifier, the next link is going to be the SMS notifier. And you have a very long chain you have a lots of methods to just set the next one. And if you want to change the order, you would be go, oh, the next one is SMS. Then you go, have to go here, change. And then SMS, oh, now the next one you have to change here. And you need to put the email here, not fire. So it's very error prone. This implementation is very error prone. Not only here when you're building the chain, also here when you implemented the links of the chain, because you basically have to copy paste this code in each one of the implementations. And it's very easy for you to miss and for, for, forget to change, for example, the property that you're checking or the business logic here. Is if you're copy pasting code and you need to change it every time, it's very easy for you to mess up in any of those steps. And actually the bug that was reported in my GitHub repo was because I messed it up here. I copy paste it and I was testing the wrong property in my uh, chain implementation. So this, it solves the problem. Huh? Oh, Ted here, so put the notifiers in a list. Yes, you could, uh, you could do that, but then you, uh, the notifier would, uh, you would need to change the implementation. So each one of them would have to return a Boolean, for example to check if the notification was sent and then you had to interrupt the processing, okay? You could do that. That's another possible implementation, uh, might even be a better one. What I'm doing is that I took this implementation straight from the original book, straight uh, Gang of Four book, okay? So that's the one that I'm criticizing. We could do a list or I'm going to propose something different. I'm not even going to use a list. We're going to use a string. And the stream, of course, could come from a list. So yes, that part of the solution is that we need to create, we need to another, an easier way for us to create the chain. And that's what we're going to do here in the live one. So what do we do? <clears throat> oh, and let me go back here to the legacy. One of the problems that we have here with the legacy implementation <clears throat> is that, for example, this code here is doing too much, yeah? You have clearly, you have two separate steps that should be split in two separate methods. You have one step here in the if that checks if this particular instance should be processing this information, this event, okay? So this is the first thing that it needs to do. This if, if it's true, I have to process or else not. So this should be a separate method. The second piece, this is the one that varies between each one of the links, is that the proper notification system, the proper business implementation. This should be a separate method also. And this is boilerplate code that is exactly the same in all the other implementations. So this method is doing too much. It should be, the responsibility should be split in separate methods. And if you check, well, this is the right implementation, the, the business implementation. And this is just a check to see if these implementations should be applied to these events. 
Well, in the JDK, we already have interfaces that can do that for us. So how can we implement that? We can do it two separate ways. You learn that the part that tests if this instance applies to this particular event is a predicate, a predicate that receives a user profile and returns either true or false. And the second part, you have a consumer which receives the user profile information and does something with it, which is the proper business implementation. So I don't have a right or better answer for that. I know that we can do it in two separate ways, uh, two different ways. You can use a Java record, which contains both a predicate and a consumer. Okay. Uh, this is one possible way, or we can create classes that implement both interfaces. So this particular class, it implements both a consumer and the predicate. So you have two separate methods. Well, the Google Wallet pass update, does it accept the, uh, uh, here, uh, the, the, the predicate test user profile? Well, return profile dot has Google Wallet pass. And the accept method is the proper business implementation. Same thing there with the email and same thing here with the SMS. If allows SMS, it's a much cleaner implementation compared to the legacy one. And when we want to properly like send a notification to the user, what we need to do is that we can we can need to create a stream and that this stream can come to a list. I could do this. I can create the stream directly. For example, we're going to create a new Google Wallet pass update notifier, new SMS notifier a new email notifier, okay? I could do this. Uh, and just because you mentioned that, I could create a list. And I could invoke the stream, uh, which would, uh, uh, then the result would be the same because I just need the stream. You're absolutely right. And stream off, and what else? Well, the first piece of my stream is that I need to filter all of the notifiers that uh, that can accept the user profile. So the first I'm going to do n dot test, and I use the user profile. And I know why IntelliJ suggests me to do this because it's optional. First part is filtering. And I don't need to go through all of the elements in the stream. I just need to find the first one for which this operation returns true. Well, the first one that checks return true. And once I find the first, if it's present, I can do what? I can do n.accept and is going to accept the user profile. And I don't know why my auto completion shows this, but it can be simpler like this one, okay? And if you want to throw an exception, if you can't find uh, the notification, you could use even or else, uh, which would have a consumer as well. And you provide either you throw an exception or most likely the user doesn't want to be notified at all. You just ignore it, which is exactly what we're doing here uh, with my code, okay? So this is the modern way for us to be implementing with Java 8 plus features, the, the chain of responsibility design pattern. And as, as Ted mentioned, this stream could come from a database, could come from a list, from a file, doesn't matter. As long as the stream, you can do this with the added benefit that if you want to change the order, you just do this. You just go through here, the code. Well, uh, now I just change the order and my code is running beautifully, okay? Lawrence is asking here, is there a way to mute someone from typing if their cat is walking on the keyboard? I don't know if you can do that automatically, but uh, it would be a very, I'm not worried about the sound. I'm worried about the commands that the cat is sending to the computer. Good point. So let's move forward. Chain of responsibility, visitor. Let's move to visitor. This one, 
Uh, as I said in the in the beginning of the presentation, visitor, the first time I tried, I wanted to find uh, a problem to be applying the visitor. And there are very few situations in your uh, career as a developer where when you need a visitor, but if you need a visitor, you need really need a visitor because that's the best possible way for you to be uh, solving the problem. Okay. So uh, what can we, uh, and let's give you some context. A visitor is useful for, for example, you have a code, you have like a type of customer and uh, the customer or your clients can be either an uh, individual or can be a corporation. And you want your operation to vary depending on the type. So what you do, you create a strategy. So in the client class, you would create a method called process invoice and you would implement it differently in the individual and in the corporation, okay? But then you have another module in the system that has a different business knowledge uh, logic for another thing. If you want to send a shipment, it's different if it's individual or if it's a corporation for the shipment, for the shipping module so in the shipping module you would create another method in the client class called shipment or start shipment or something so you would implement it in differently in the individual and in the corporation classes and then you start to have a problem because you have multiple different operations in your system and they vary between the type of the client that you have, individual or corporation. And suddenly your client class and your individual class and your corporation class, they become bloated. To make matters worse, your, very likely your client is inside a bounded context, is in a certain module already in your system. But the shipment module, which has the shipping logic, depends on a type that is available in another module. And then suddenly you have business logic that should be belonging and should be should be stored in the ship uh, in the the shipping or shipment module and is implemented in another module. And the invoice system, the invoice module, also has business logic that is in the core module. So you have uh, you have like low cohesion and low in high coupling in your system, which is something that you want to avoid. When you face this particular situation, the visitor design pattern is one of the few design patterns that allows you to decouple the logic. So you have an operation that varies by type and this type is declared in another module and you want the business logic to still belong in your system, that's when you use a visitor, okay? And let's show you some code on how can we do that. So the legacy implementation of the visitor design pattern is like this one. So <clears throat> you have, I have here my hierarchy. I have Google Wallet Pass, can be a loyalty card, can be an event ticket, and can be others. For which one of my concrete implementations I have in my visitor interface, I have this method, visit, concrete interface, and the type. Visit, concrete implementation, and the type. And then when I'm calling this, and I want to create a new operation in my module, the, the shipping module, or the invoice module, I do this. I get a card, and I create a, a call accept, and I create a new visitor with the operation that varies by type. So if it's a loyalty card, I can code my stuff here. If it's an event ticket, I can code my stuff here. So that's how you can create like uh, high cohesion and low coupling in your system when you have multiple different modules and your operation needs to vary by the type that you're applying the operation. So this is the typical solution of the visitor. The problem is that the person needs to know it's a visitor and 
the visitor is very hard for you to read. So because you have this very long implementation, you have to create a visitor, it needs to visit different types, and you need to create a visitor interface. And to make matters worse, if you create a new type, generic pass extends Google Wallet pass. Okay, and you implemented it. Well, if you forget to do, to do this, visitor.visit, this, well, now it's not compiling. Well, you have to add it to the generic pass. So as long as you don't forget to provide this implementation, the visitor is compile time safe which means that if you added a new type to your visitor and you implement it properly here, your compiler will complain that you didn't add these particular methods in your interface and all the visitor implementations in your system will break, okay? Because, well, if you have like 10 different implementations across your system, you know that it won't compile, you won't be able to deploy your system which is a good thing. And why is that? Because it's much better than having a runtime exception. Because you sent the update, your system has been running for one month, and now suddenly you have a problem because, well, nobody called this particular method for this particular time type until today. But today we have a major uh, bug in production because it's a runtime exception and not a compile time error. So uh, one of the benefits of the visitor is that it's uh, it's compile time safe. You need to implement it here, okay? But it's a very ugly implementation and it's very hard to read. How can we do better in 2023? We can do this. Well, with the visitor implementation, let me catch up here. So instead of implementing a visitor, we can do this abstract class, Google Wallet Pass, and we have different implementations, loyalty, event ticket, and that's just two. So whenever we have an operation that needs to vary by type, we can now with Java 21 plus, we can perform an enhanced switch. So we can do the switch pass, okay? And what is the time of the type of the pass? Well, if it's a loyalty, we can return. Uh, we can return one. If it's an event ticket, we can return two. And oh, forgot the case here. And if it's, uh, it's not any of them, you will return zero. Actually, never. Okay. Let's see. L. Oh, I need to provide E. Okay. That's what was missing in my implementation. So I return and I need a default here. Why is that? Well, because just in case you didn't cover all the, uh, the types, you need a default implementation, okay? How can we improve this with Java 21 Plus? Well, luckily for us, now with Java 21 Plus, we can create sealed classes. So if we create a sealed class, I can say, Google Wallet Pass is a sealed class and it only permits loyalty, and event tickets. I exhaust all the possibilities. And here, because these classes are final, the default piece is optional. Why? Because all the possibilities are already covered in my switch. Okay? So if I decide to add here, well, final class, generic pass extends Google Wallet pass. I'll have a compile time error because, well, Google Wallet Pass is a sealed class and it doesn't allow any other children. So if I want to add another type, I need to go here and say that, 
Well, now generic pass is also allowed. And when I do that, I'll have a compile time error saying, well, the list is not exhaustive anymore. Now you need to do this, generic pass needs to be three. And since Java 20 plus or 19, I don't, uh, I don't remember exactly. We can also do switches based on properties of my types. So if my loyalty class has a property called size, I could do this case loyalty L when L dot size bigger than three, then I return five case loyalty L when L dot size bigger than four, bigger than 10, no, smaller than two. Then I return six, okay? And I have here the lawyer, well, one, okay? And I have here all the options, which can, which is an exhaustive uh, list, right? So this is the modern way for us to be implementing the visitor pattern. Uh, type safe has all the benefits of the previous visitor, but without all that boilerplate code. What else? Specification. Specification, I'm just going to go through very quickly with the specification because I think we're ru almost running out of time. I want to know that people are hungry or have other things to do and or people are eager for the, for the raffles. So specification, where is my specification here? Here. Specification is very useful for uh, when we want to give like, uh, you, you want to create a query in the database or you want to create a, a, a condition in your system and you don't want magic numbers or magic conditions. For example, this one, s.lent, if you, you want to check a string, if it has 16 characters and you want to match if a string is all digits, instead of just Doing this is much better when you can give a, a name to it. For example, this na the name of this condition is right length. And the name of this condition is, is numeric. So if you want to check if a certain string is a potential credit card number, uh, what do you do? You just compose these conditions. Right length and is numeric. So you can run it. Uh, and for us to be able, and this design pattern I took from domain driven design. And if you want to do that, uh, if you wanted to do that in the past, you wouldn't to create an interface called specification. You wouldn't implement the and, the or, the not conditions, and you would need to create concrete implementations for each one of them. Luckily for us, in 2023, we don't need to do any of that because the predicate interface in the JDK is already a specification. So if you want to compose multiple conditions, we just need to do uh, write length equals to this and assign it to a predicate. And then we can compose like with, uh, with the not, with the and, with the or, with all the possible conditions already implemented by the JDK. So you already know it works. You don't even need to implement tests to test the predicate. It's already in the JDK. Okay, I think that's what I wanted to show you today. Uh, thank you so much for staying with me until now. If you want to learn more about Google Wallet, please, you can sign up for our developer newsletter. We don't spam, spam anyone. We only send an email every three months, every quarter. So the QR code can point you to the newsletter. And again, my information on the right side of your screen, my email and my Twitter handle or my Blue Sky, my Mastodon account. All of them are the same handle. So feel free to reach out to me. And thank you so much. I don't know if you have any other questions, but if you do, uh, I'm here to, for them. Okay, so does anyone have any more questions for our speaker here tonight? So if we don't have anything, usually if we meet in person, there's usually a round of applause or anything. But since we cannot mute, at least I'll clap. So thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Edson, for, for presenting tonight. So what I'll do here is I'll end the recording and then we will uh, move on here to uh, the raffle.
Yeah, thank you so much. As I said, it was a pleasure uh, being here today at the St. Louis Jug. It was a pleasure uh, to meet uh, some of you. It's a pleasure. And uh, again, I hope to be able to meet you in person anytime soon. And well, see you uh, until next time. I I'll leave you to the raffle, and I well, cheers to the winners. <laughs>